Good evening, everyone. It's beautiful to be able to learn together once again. We're going to go through the portion of Ki Tetze, which is the Shabbat reading of this week. And then we're going to try and take some life messages, which can apply the beautiful teachings of our Torah to our day-to-day -day living. So as a summary, what we talk about this week is that we're talking about um, a war. If a soldier goes out to war, and that was a theme that began last week when we started talking about different categories of population who were exempt from war under certain circumstances. And here in this week's portion, we deal quite a lot about the soldiers, even, even in war, how they have to behave. It begins by talking about a situation where a man, a soldier, sees a woman amongst the captives, falls in love with her, and the various conditions that are put on that man to be able to possibly uh, retain a relationship and commit himself and herself to him long term. Um, and that includes slowing down so that it's not just uh, caught up in the passion of war, the passion of excitement as a result of war. Sometimes there's a re reaction to the, the pain and the difficulties of war. And uh, maybe the person is just overwhelmed because he's de detached from home. So he's got to make sure that he is uh, going to slow down the process, give a chance to see what she looks like when she isn't in her most beautiful form, and just breathe a little bit and take it slow so that he can be sure that this is something he wants to get involved in. Uh, it then speaks about a firstborn son that is born to marriage and that that, that, that son has a bachor, the law of bachor, which is a double inheritance. Then it moves to a, a, a negative situation of a ben sore umere. Ben sore umere is described in detail in the Gemara as a rebellious son who is in absolutely untrainable. You cannot discipline this kid. He eats like a glutton. He just behaves in an abominable way and to such an extreme that there's a thought and a, a, a question as to whether he's a threat to society long term. And one of the very rare occasions, normally we don't judge a person until they reach a point that they are in, uh, in need of judgment. This is a child who's behaving very badly, but he's, he's not Nachar Sofa, he's judged now for what could be the results long term. And under very specific conditions, this child, is put to death. But there are so many conditions that relate to the possibility of carrying this out that there is discussion in the Gemara whether, whether it's a theoretical um, presentation of possibility or whether it in fact ever, ever happened. Uh, for example, the parents have to speak exactly the same voice. They have to, there's a whole lot of technical conditions, all of which are very symbolic about child rearing and educating a child. Our parents have to be on the same station and, and, and the same have to carry the same ethical values in, in order for the child not to be confused. So that's the Ben Sorio Mer. And then it speaks about speedy burial of deceased. And hopefully we'll come back to that point in the in the details. But this is in fact the portion that tells us that we should not delay a funeral. A funeral should actually happen ASAP as soon as possible on the same day in Yerushalayim, even on the same evening. They don't allow anyone overnight. So I've, I've been to funerals in Yerushalayim at one o'clock in the morning. Then it speaks about what happens if a person lost an item, and we're going to have to do a whole lot of details relating to how you re repatriate that item to the original owner, um, what's the process of doing that, and how that's found in the verses, and what is symbolic. Uh, of, of what, what is this symbolic of beyond a physical item that you found that belonged to somebody. Then it speaks about aiding to lift an animal that has fallen under its burden. You're walking down the street and you see there's an animal that's laden with a whole lot of packages and it's falling under its burden. <clears throat> so you should help the animal, help the person who owns the animal to lift the animal, hopefully before it falls, it's much harder once it falls, so there's a, a lot of sensitivity, a sensitivity to the animal that's overloaded, sensitivity to the person who is about to go through a terrible loss, um, the pain of the animal, all of these things are considered. 
Point number seven, which might be very relevant in our world today, is a prohibition against cross-dressing, that men should wear men's clothes and women should wear women's clothes. And we should uh, be very clear in who's dressing in what. Full stop. Then it speaks about ki kare, if you chance upon a nest and there's a bird and the bird has eggs or ephrahim or little chicklets. So don't take away the um, mother bird and the eggs, but chase away the mother bird before you take its eggs. So you're concerned at least on one level about sense, being sensitive to the mother bird that you don't take away the eggs in front of it. That's painful to the mother. But it's also telling you don't take the whole scene, don't take the nest, the mother and the eggs and the, 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 the chickens, but rather take the produce of and allow the mother to go free so that it can once again possibly have other eggs. Don't destroy the source. Don't take away the whole scene because you are in fact stunting the possibility of the uh, regeneration of that uh, bird and its family. Then it speaks about building a safety fence around a flat roof. So if you have a flat roof, which is frequented by people, you actually invite people, they go up a staircase and they have sundowners on the roof. Um, um, and, and the roof has to have a fence around it to avoid the possibility of being the cause of somebody falling to their death. The similar application of this would be a swimming pool where, God forbid, children could be um, invited and be running around the home and then not supervised and a catastrophe could happen in one's home. So don't have any situation in your home that could cause danger to somebody who enters into your home. A fence around the roof is one of them. A fence around a pool would be a similar thing. Then it speaks about prohibitions about mixing various different items. You should not mix and sow different seeds together. In fact, we're learning these laws in the Rambam, in Maimonides, these very um, days. Um, it's it's not, not to graft trees. So you're allowed to eat nectarines, and you're even allowed to buy nectarines. You're probably allowed to plant nectarines, but you can't be the one who actually, in the first place, grafted together the peach and the plum that enabled that a new species to emerge. Similarly, in number 11, prohibition about plowing with mixed pairs of animals. <coughs> so if you have an ox who's very powerful and a donkey that's less powerful, and you use both of them to plow, there's going to be huge discomfort because they work at different speeds and at different strengths, and one of those animals is going to be in pain. So make sure that you don't have two different strengths of species spanned in together to pull something because one of them is going to be pulling beyond the strength of the other and it's going to be a very painful situation. Continuing the theme of mixing, it says you shall not mix in a garment both wool and linen. Made should be spelt M-A-D-E, made of wool and linen. So that's called shatnes. And even till today, there are laboratories all over the world, including in South Africa, to check that in the lapel of your suit, which might be a wool suit, there should not be linen, which they sometimes use to stiffen the collars, because that would be a prohibition of shatnes. From there goes into the laws of tzitzit, that we wear on a four-cornered garment, we have tassels bound and wound and tied in a very specific way, so that when we look at these tzitzit, we'll be reminded to fulfill the mitzvahs of Hashem. Full stop goes back to the theme of the army. What happens if you are part of a battalion? You have to ensure that there is hygiene even in the army camp. I've said this point very often before, that sometimes the, the Torah presents something where it might be counterintuitive. You might think it doesn't really matter, but the Torah tells you it matters even there, how much more so under normal circumstances. So if we have to worry about hygiene, which includes carrying a spade. A Jewish soldier carried a spade on his satchel, in addition to his arms and his uh, military equipment, a spade, so that if the person would need to relieve themselves in the field, they would have the opportunity of covering over and leaving the terrain exactly as they found it. Even in a situation of war, you should be sensitive to the environment and to make sure that you do not cause 
um, um, destruction to the environment, even in a situation of war. Last week, we spoke about destroying fruit trees. Even in a state of war, you should not cut down a tree. You think it doesn't matter. People are dying. So who cares about worrying about sensitivities that are so subtle? Even there, and then how much more so when it's in your backyard and you're not under pressure, make sure that you retain cleanliness, hygiene, and that things go as they should do. Then speaks about it, paying or receiving, char charging or being a person to pay interest. So if you take a loan from a Jew, you have no right to charge them interest. It applies specifically to a Jew, and it's an interesting prohibition that people would say, well, obviously, well, why so obviously? When you rent a car, you're allowed to pay money to rent the car. At the end, you give back the car, and you give them rental money for the time that you had the car in your possession. So why can't you rent money? You borrow 100 rand, so you give back the 100 rand, and you give an extra surcharge for the rental of that money for the period of that week, but you cannot. With, with items, you can charge a rental fee, but not for money, which is called interest. You cannot charge a rental fee. And, and uh, it's a serious provision, both on the person lending and on the person borrowing. Uh, interestingly, that applies specifically to Jews. Um, Non-Jews, it was a, a very common practice. Um, the merchant of Venice and, and other references, Jews were very involved in money lending often held against us for um, being in a profession that, that caused other people great pain because people borrow money easily and it's much harder to, to, to pay back. But the main reason, the main reason why Jews were money lenders is because we weren't allowed to go into professions. We weren't allowed to enter into the academies of learning. And therefore we had very few possession, um, professions that a Jew was allowed to go into. This was one of them. Then it speaks about the laws of marriage and divorce and the leveret marriage, which is when a person, a man dies, um, it doesn't have any children, then the brother of that deceased husband, the brother, the brother-in-law of the um, wife, should take the wife in marriage to perpetuate the name of the deceased brother husband. That's obviously only if she desires it and he desires it. And if he doesn't desire it and she, so there's a whole process which cancels this relationship between the brother-in-law and the wife of the deceased husband. Then it speaks about um, taking collateral for loans. So if you lend somebody a thousand rand and you take their bed or their um, blanket so the Torah is very, very clear that even though you have taken collateral because you want to be sure that you're going to get your money back, you have to give it back to the person when that person desperately needs what you have taken as collateral. So if it's a blanket and they're freezing cold, make sure to take it back for the night so that they are not going to be freezing cold. Then it speaks about kidnapping, which is a capital offense. Stealing items and property is bad enough terrible, but to steal a person is a capital offense. Then it says, full stop, remember Miriam, who was afflicted with a unique form of spiritual leprosy. It wasn't a physical ailment that we normally have as a medical definition called leprosy. It had all the um, symptoms of leprosy, but it emerged and came as a result. It was a symptom of a deeper rot which related specifically to Lashon Hara, when a person spoke evil about another human being, they received leprosy and then they had to leave the camp and experience isolation and being alone. They wanted to cause isolation of a human being by talking negatively about them. They have to experience that themselves. Miriam had spoken, at least on her level, disparagingly about her brother Moshe Rabbeinu, particularly about his practice in the home and, and his relationship with his wife. And as a result of that, Miriam got leprosy and she was taken out of the camp. And the Jewish people waited for her for seven days, which is one of the references to the seven-day period post-death, which is called the Shiva period. And then we want to speak a bit, of, a bit about this, and that was the name that we gave the shir, is that we have to have accurate weights and measures, business practices, honesty, and being 100% scrupulous to the extreme. We'll come back to that point. 
And finally, the portion ends with saying, remember what Amalek did to you. Hashem karchab aderech, they pulled you off on the road. When you emerged from Egypt and all the miracles were happening around and everybody was so afraid of the Jewish people because how 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 the luster of Hashem's presence and the miracles that were happening, everyone feared the Jewish people. Amalek was the first nation that attacked the Jewish people post the miracles of the Exodus. And specifically, they attacked the stragglers, the, the, the weak. They were the first um, origin of terrorism, which attacks the vulnerable people of society rather than fighting on the war front against the army. Take out the, the vulnerable population and we were told to destroy the nation of Amalek. We know that um, King Shaul was a little bit lenient in following out the instruction and from him emerged, from Amalek emerged Haman and we had the story of Purim and other situations where sometimes misplaced um, compassion um, results in, in, in terrible circumstances as well. So we were told to remember Amalek. It's one of the six remembrances that we actually recite immediately after davening every single day. We're told to remember. Remember the Shabbos. Remember um, a number of things that, that we remember every single day. One of them is Amalek. Let's move on to some of the messages that we can derive from this very, very full portion and diverse details about it. So the first thing I want to share comes from the Rebbe relating to go to war. And it says, Ki the name of this week's portion is Ki which means when you'll go out, which is dealing with the soldiers going out to war. Al oivecha, on your enemy. But normally the Hebrew word would be against your enemy, but it doesn't. It says when you go out to war, on your enemy. Al. Al means on. So two ways that we're going to learn about this being higher than your enemy, be above your enemy. The first is that if you want to achieve victory in a war, you have to gain the higher ground. Firstly, with confidence. Don't go into the war saying, maybe I'll be successful. I'm not sure if I have the capacity to win this. I'm going in with a lot of doubt as to whether I want to fight in the first place. because I'm not sure if I can pull it off. When you go into a war with a self-defeat and a lack of, of belief in one's ability to win it, that's the first step to losing it. Because you have to have confidence when you go out to war. And obviously, we're going to take this beyond going out as a soldier with your gun, God forbid, to fight an enemy, a physical enemy and a threat of, a, of an army that's coming against you. The wars that we fight are sometimes much closer to home. They are the wars of moral choices, of making the right decisions, of fighting for the right thing to do in this world, to say the right words rather than the wrong words. All the things that our Yetzirah, our evil inclination, tries to take us in a negative direction, we're constantly in a state of war. We're always fighting, fighting to do the right thing. So when we are fighting against our animalistic soul, our lower form of the human being, when we're fighting against the, the drives and the energies of a human being to behave badly, go out to war, go out on your enemy, believe in yourself, take the higher ground, believe that you can win it. Because if you're going to fight moral choices, not convinced that you have the capacity to win it, you've lost before you've started. So that's the first explanation on a deeper level. What does it mean when you go out to war on your enemy? Be higher than your enemy. Believe that you have the capacity and that you are stronger, that you are above your enemy. On a more moral level, it's the second point B, is that when you go out to, fall, to fight a war, just know that you have a moral code that is higher. Don't stoop to the level of your adversary. Don't say, because my enemy behaves this way, so that's why I behave that way too. When you go out to war on higher, know that you, as a Jewish soldier, have a higher code. And whilst the world is so keen to condemn the IDF, the Israel Defense Force, and see them as uh, 
being uh, against uh, civilians, the civilian Arab populations in towns and behaving harshly and, and, and being an aggressor and being all the things that they say, that's similar to, to apartheid in South Africa, they're all of the extreme definitions of a Jewish soldier. But we know, we know that when a Jewish soldier takes the oath of allegiance, he holds the Tanakh. There's a connection to thousands of years of our history. And we know that so many times Jews and Jewish soldiers were put at risk in order not to cause um, want and loss of life. It would have been much easier in Gaza, in Gaza to carpet bomb buildings than to send soldiers into booby trap buildings, building by building, room by room, where they put themselves into the extreme danger. Because we believed that we don't carpet down bomb civilians. And yes, in every war, there's going to be collateral damage. Whilst everyone points fingers at Israel for, for, for not being a humane army, the people that objectively have given assessments have said that the IDF is the most humane army. And wherever wars have been fought, the proportions of civilians being caught up is much less in Israeli conflicts than in other conflicts around the world. Why? Because we believe that we still got to behave like a human being, even in a situation of war. So when we go out to do war, al Ivecha, be higher. Don't say that if my enemy is using these tactics, therefore those tactics are free game for me as well. No, al Ivecha, know that you're higher than your enemy. You have a moral responsibility to aspire to that's higher than that of your enemy. Moving on to the next subject, um, well, we've actually discussed this, that when you go out to war, you'll take a captive. And it speaks about whether you're allowed to marry that captive and under what circumstances you might be able to marry that, that, that um, okay. sorry, I have a bad throat, so this is gonna help a little bit. So um, when we go out to, to war, there's the possibility of taking a captive. What does that mean on a deeper level? Because we, thank God, are not soldiers in an army. We're not fighting on the battlefront in the trenches, as many people have to do. So our battles, we said, are moral battles. They're spiritual battles. They're inner conflicts that we have to wage a war to win, to make sure that we win in the sense of making the right decisions. So when we go out to our personal war, our inner moral war, so then we should take captive. Something should come out of that inner conflict that allows us to grow and to develop and to become bigger than we were before we went into that conflict. So whenever we go into a challenge and whenever we have to fight a battle, we shouldn't want to come out just unscathed which would be a celebration that we didn't get hurt, but we should emerge from that battle with newfound additional strength. And the example that we are given is that Yaakov and the angel of Asaph, we know that famous story when they, were, when they uh, were striving together and the angel of Asaph caught Yaakov alone on the other side of the river and uh, he strove with him the whole night. And when it came to morning, Yaakov said, the angel said, you have to send me away because it's late now. It's, I have to get back to, to the early gates before 8 o'clock. They closed the gates over there. I've got to get back, so you've got to let me go. And, and Yaakov says to the angel of Esau, I'm not going to let you go, Kim Berachtani, until you give me a blessing. And it's obviously a very strange interaction between Yaakov and the angel of Esau, where he stood to lose so much the whole night. And finally, the angel is saying, let me go. I just want to go. I'll leave you alone. Yaakov should have celebrated the moment that he was able to emerge from the darkness of the night, symbolic of lack of clarity and being overwhelmed by darkness in, 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 the, in, in, the, in the simple sense and in, in the, what it represents. Yaakov said, no, I'm not going to emerge from a whole night of fighting with the angel of Esau which represented this conflict between the moral choices of right and the evil choices of bad. I'm not going to emerge from this simply the same, let you go. I want a bracha to come out of this. Imagine saying to your enemy that you fought with all night, give me a bracha. Yaakov was saying, I have to emerge stronger from the result that I have been through 
a waging of a war. And what does he land up um, gaining from this angel of Asaph? That he is given the name not to be Yaakov alone, but he would have a new name called Yisrael. Because you were able to strive with people and even with angelical beings, and you were victorious and you succeeded. That's what Yisrael represents. Yaakov represents the heel holder. He was called Yaakov because he held on to the heel of his brother Esau at birth. They were twins. So Yaakov says, I'm not going to let you just go. And, and this is the discussion he's having with the angel then. But we should say every time we go through a battle, we go through a struggle, or we've been through a challenge, we shouldn't be sufficing with saying, thank God. I emerged from it unscathed. I have survived. We don't want to just survive from challenges. We want to thrive from challenges. We want to grow and develop and become a higher human being by virtue of the battle that we've been through. Otherwise, it's not worth it. If we've been through a battle, we ourselves should emerge much greater and bigger than we were. And so then Yaakov turns out to have this new name, Yisrael, and it becomes indicative that any negative encounter that we go through in life must lead to a net gain, not just to a survival mode of emerging and that we survived and we're still alive, but there has to be a net gain. We have to be bigger, better, a higher form of self as a result of the challenge that we've been through. Then speaks about a, a funeral that has to take place immediately. What's the context of a human being who has to be brought to burial immediately? It says if a person was put to death, and as a, at the end of being put to death, they were hanged. It was almost like that people would see that a person has been put to death and be reminded to never ever repeat the, the evil doing that this person has done. So it's a, a, a symbolic reminder to be careful. Now, we know that the, this hanging people didn't happen like every day. This was not a, it says that if it happened once in 70, 70 years, 70 years, that it would be called a murderous base then. That's how rare the actual execution of a human being was. It was a deterrent. It was applicable at a time where it would carry the strength of deterring people from sinning, not being a consequence, no, not a vengeance for a person doing the bad thing, therefore he gets hanged. It was supposed to be such a fearful consequence that people wouldn't sin in the first place. But if, God forbid, a person did and was put to death and then is hanged, he should not remain hanging for longer than that day. And the analogy that is brought in the Gemara is imagine there was a, two twins. A man is in, uh, there's, there's a king and he has a twin brother. And the king's living in the palace and the twin brother he becomes a vagabond, a renegade, and he behaves in a terrible way. And eventually he, he does a terrible crime and he's hanged. So imagine if the, the, the twin, exact twin of the king is hanging from a tree to make a point about um, bad behavior, behaving in an evil way. And the king himself has the same face as that as his brother. So it's very awkward that anybody walking by sees the king hang because they look exactly the same. And it's all an analogy that we emulate Hashem. Hashem created us in his image. And we carry a certain um, presence of Hashem in the way we conduct our lives. And when a human being is hanged, it means that the image of Hashem, like in the case of the twin brothers, the image of Hashem, which we were created in, is there hanging as well. It's a terrible thing. So for that reason, don't let it be for longer than just the next day so that you can bring the, the, the body to burial. This is where we get it from, that we should immediately, God forbid, in a kind of situation of loss, not get caught up with convenience of cousin so-and-so or uncle so-and-so, but to actually bring the person to burial as soon as possible. Leniencies are, are extended to children who might not be able to be there and say Kaddish and, and the, the trauma that that could cause for a child. So 
um, it is extended. Um, that that you um, so 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 we, because we create an image of Hashem, even in a situation where somebody is killed and hanged, it shouldn't be allowed to remain longer. And the only time that we allow burial to be delayed is if it's of benefit and honor to the deceased, like immediate family coming from overseas, and it would be good for them. But even then, we know today practically our base din will never allow it more than three days. And as I said in Yerushalayim, not even till the next morning. That's how serious it is. Then it talks about lost items. And it says, Shave to Shiveni, you shall surely return. Return them, return them to your brother if you find the lost item. So the Gemara in Tainus, we actually learned it in our Gemara class after doubling at Great Park. In the Gemara in Tainus, it speaks about Rabbi Hanina ben Daiso, once upon a time, found um, a few chickens. And he, he saw that they were tied in such a way or, or, or collected in such a way that um, there was a sign. So therefore, it was possible that somebody would come and claim the chickens. And therefore, he decided to keep them. But as the chickens uh, continued to wait and the guy didn't turn up, he hadn't been to the city for a long time, the, the chickens had eggs and the eggs had chickens. And before he knew it, there was like a whole hawk of, of chickens that he was feeding keeping them for when the guy comes back to claim. And then it was just too many chickens. So, so the suggestion was to buy sheep, which you'd have fewer. The value is much more. So a lot of chickens would be the cost of one sheep. So try and rather turn the chickens into sheep. And when the person comes, you'll be able to give them the value of, of the yield of this uh, of those chickens, the original chickens that had eggs and other. And they eventually became herds and, and lots of herds. And one, one day, Abichanina Mendoza, who's looking and trying to find the owner, he has somebody saying, oh, this is interesting. This is the place where I, many years ago, I remember I lost a few chickens over here. Abichanina Mendoza runs out and he says, you the guy, got the signs, get the, gets the clarity. This is the guy who owned the original few chickens. He takes him to the backyard and he says, all of this in front of you, all of these herds of the animals and an abundance of wealth. I've been keeping it for you. It's all yours because this is what was yielded from your property. It belongs to you. So it's brought in the Gemara as an example of how careful, even though it's like this cost him gesund and time and effort, that's how caring we have to be to return, uh, restore a lost item to the original owner. And all of this is very symbolic as well. The Chafetz Chaim, saintly memory, one of the great giants of the previous generation, he says, Chaim, he says that you have to return. You have to return the property of somebody who lost that property. So if they lost a um, a wallet or money or something, and, and there is an ability to identify it by a sign, how much or where there was a, a crease or where the, the corner was frayed, or what it was bundled together in, or what the wallet looks like, however the person is able to identify it as his, so you have to return it. And if the person loses it again, Hashem to Shiveni, return them, return them. Meaning even a hundred times. Even if the guy is such a scatterbrain that he's losing his item again and again and again, you say, well, I brought it back to you. Now again, you have to do it again. Always look after your brother, even if they are of the uh, weak um, ilk that can never ever look after their items properly and therefore they seem to be quite at fault for being constantly losing their items from outside we've got to restore the Chafetz Chaim said if it applies to physical property how careful we have to be to restore an item to the original person how much more so when we're talking about lost souls when we live in a generation and Jews are lost People are lost. How much more so, said the Chavetz Chaim of saintly memory, do we have an obligation to return the lost item to restore strength to a person who's lost up the creek, doesn't know which way to go. He's a lost human being. Bring him back. Many Jews today are lost. They lost to their religion. They lost to knowledge and to the ability to participate and to feel at home in a shul. They just lost from the Jewish community. 
So if we have to worry about a lost wallet, for sure we have to worry about a lost brother. So said the Chavetz Chaim, and certainly it was the theme of the Rebbe's commitment to setting up Chabad houses, centers, wherever it was in the world, from Alaska to every conceivable country in Europe, to, to Australia, to, to South America, to, to seek out Jewish people so that you can help them find their way back home. So if we're worried about lost items, for sure we have to worry about lost souls. And I don't want to spend too much time on this because I want to get to the, the main point that we're talking about. It actually lists a whole lot of specific items that a person might have lost. If you see that your friend has lost an item, and then it carries on to say, his ox, his donkey, his garment, his sheep, or anything that your brother lost. It's called a clow. If you see a lost items, and then it's prat, it's, it's detailed. And then it once again takes it to a general statement to all of the things that your brother might lose. So we actually have a question over here as to why it would speak about details if it's then summing up and saying, well, anything that they lost. So why mention these details in the first place? Why mention ox, donkey, and garment, and sheep if you're going to end off the sentence by saying any item that your friend lost that would include ox and donkey and, she and garments and sheep and anything else? So why mention these specifically? So the Gemara says that we could actually learn something that relates to a lost item from each of these examples. For example, a garment, you know from a garment that a person knows their garment, even though there might be a thousand or ten thousand of those garments being sold in the shops. And it's the same size and the same color, and the same everything. Nevertheless, a person would is normally able to recognize their garment because they're familiar with it. And they know that it has a bit of a frayed edge over here. There's a bit of a stain that was indelible and didn't come out and, th and therefore this is what the color looks like the person is very afraid with their garment and therefore they would know which signs to give if somebody had found a garment the person would come and say oh you found a shirt i lost a shirt the person who found it would say well tell me about the shirt and you'd say well i know that there was a button missing or there was an extra button sewn in at the bottom and this is what the color we're very afraid and familiar with our clothing and we learn from there that any other item, garment or anything else that you find in the street, you have to return it by virtue of the person giving signs to show that he's the real owner. Because maybe he's not the real owner. Maybe somebody announced that money was found. Maybe he's just taking a chance. So that's why when you announce that you have found money, you would say money was found, but you wouldn't say it was a 20 rand note or it was a 50 rand note. You want the person who's claiming that he lost it to come forward and say, I know exactly how much money it was. It was, you know, 58 um, rand. And it was lying next to this wall and the money was put together. And this is the bag that it was in. So what we learn from a garment and why it's mentioned specifically, if any way it says, and any item that you might lose. So why would it mention Garment specifically. Garment teaches us that the way we identify a lost item and are able to we are able to restore it to the original owner is by identifiable signs, which garments we normally know exactly what those identifiable signs are. What do we learn from donkey? That if what happens if it's a donkey and you can't identify the donkey, but you can identify the saddle, the donkeys we use it as vehicles for driving from one place to another, they rode on their donkeys. So if you can not identify the, the donkey itself, because it's brown and there's many brown or many white donkeys, and, and how would you identify it? If you can identify features of the saddle, which is attached to the donkey, that would be a good way of establishing that the donkey is the one that you lost because you've described the exact saddle. So that's what we learn from donkey being mentioned specifically. Garment to tell us about signs, donkey to tell us about the, that it can be identified by its saddle. And ox, what do we learn from ox? That even the hairs that grew on its tail, which at that time was quite a valuable part of, of an ox, Maybe they used it to string their violins. It was his, or not to, to string the violins, but for the bow that plays the violin. So 
even the hair that grew on the animal that you found, when you found that it didn't have hairs that were of value, that had grown in, and then you had this in your property for a while, and now it has additional hair, so you could say, well, when I found that it didn't have this hair, so the hair belongs to me. And the answer is no. You have to um, return the whole item, even that part of the animal that grew and developed beyond what its value was when it was lost. And the Gemara says that a sheep is a bit problematic to know what we learn from the specific detail of sheep. And there's a whole beautiful drasha that I have of it, but I want to try and move on because of the limited time. If there's time, we'll come back to it. Speaks about not bringing blood into your house when a falling person falls from your roof. We needed to have a fence around our roof or around our pool. So there's a whole discussion in the, in the Midrash that says a person who dies, it's determined by Hashem. If a person fell from a roof, a person didn't die then because you didn't put a fence around the roof. Hashem decided that that person would die. It can't be that a person just dies because somebody else made a very bad mistake. That means that we really shouldn't have died, but we died because of somebody else's behavior. We die because Hashem decided that we've completed our mission in this world and uh, we've got to move on to the next world. And, and why then would you be punishing the person or holding accountable the person that didn't put a, a fence around his roof or, or created a dangerous situation? You could say, why do I have to worry about um, this person? He would never have died if Hashem didn't want him to die. So obviously he deserved it and it was necessary. So, so we say no. That person died because Hashem decided. But we made choices. And the choices that we make can either heal people, lift people, or God forbid, be a source of destruction. So whilst Hashem's going to determine the lifespan and that this person is living and this person's not, we're choosing which part of Hashem's plan for that day we're going to be associated with. And we should make the choices to want to be attached to the things that are particularly good. Finally, we're getting to what we said was the um, shear, so we're not actually giving it enough time, but weights and measures. And very quickly, how important is honesty in business practices in our Jewish religion and in the Torah? How? It is of the greatest extreme. In fact, there are only three items that are not allowed into a Jewish home. Not only not allowed to be eaten or not allowed to be used, you're not allowed them into your home. One of them is chametz on Pesach. Even if you don't eat it, you cannot have it in your home. You've got to sell it or you've got to lock it up. And The second thing is idols. Whether you're worshipping them or not worshipping them, don't have an idol in your house. That's how bad it is. And the third thing is the subject. You should not have dishonest weights and measures, which means that a person who's an unscrupulous businessman would have a five kilo weight. He would have two. You have one that he uses to sell, which is uh, a little bit less than five kilos. It says five kilos on, but it's a little bit less because he wants to give away less produce. But when he's buying, he has a five kilo weight that's worth and weighs more because he wants to get more. Or they would have hollowed out weights. And in the hole, they would either put lead or, or uh, uh, something that's a very light material. So the weights have to be no holes, no place to put push anything that could weigh it down or could give you a vague representation of the weight. A person is not even allowed to have it in their home, even as an ornament. That is how serious the Torah is about honest weights and measures. One of the questions that says when we get to the pearly gates after we finished our life in this world, they'll ask us a number of questions. And one of the first questions is, did you have scrupulous business practices where you're honest. Every one of us is going to face Hashem at the end of our lifetime. And the one question, one of the important questions that are going to be asked of us is that we behave honestly. That is how serious honesty is in our lives. We are absolutely bidden to be scrupulous, to make sure that even the possibility of giving a person, shortchanging them, and weighing something with less than it really is should not be allowed into our home so we never come to use it.
And on a deeper level, on this I'll end in the last next 30 seconds, it says you shouldn't have two sets of measures. Like I explained, one set of measures, one weight that you use to buy with, and one weight that you use to sell with. It's like the banks, like their rates, the published rates. How much is a dollar? Well, it depends if you're buying or selling. There's always a buyer's rate and a selling rate. What's the rate? What's the actual rate? And let's use that for both buying and selling. That's more or less what we're saying there. So what does it mean on a deeper level, this moral two sets of measures? Don't have two sets of measures. Have a five kilo measure that's absolute and don't have a, a set of measures with, that, that, that allows you to have one for selling and one for buying. But on a deeper level, it's saying, don't have two sets of measures when you look at another human being. Because very often when it comes to ourselves, we say, I'm a very thorough person. I deal with things very specifically and very detailed. And therefore, it takes me a long time to be able to go through something because I have that positive attribute of being thorough. But when we look at somebody else who does the same thing, all we say is, that person's so slow, never ever do things fast. They're not, not able to do things quickly. So we have one way of reading our failures and a totally different way of reading somebody else's and very quickly look at the difference. That when it comes to ourselves, we say, well, I'm very discerning. I'm very careful to know the difference between one thing and another. And, and that's why I can identify problems because I'm discerning. As we see the positive light that somebody else, we say, oh, that person's always finding fault. To ourselves, we say we're taking initiative. That's a positive connotation. To another person who's taking initiative, we say such an aggressive person. So we look at the same behavior in ourselves and somebody else, and in ourselves, we give it a beautiful, positive overtone. Somebody else, we, we, we do the opposite. To ourselves, we say, I have the courage of my conviction. I stand. Another person, we say, he's opinionated and so stubborn, just never, ever listens to another view. For ourselves, we say, I've got the courage of my conviction. To ourselves, we say, I'm a flexible human being. I, let, I, I don't want to get in, in the way of somebody, so I'm flexible. That's a positive connotation. Somebody else is spineless. To ourselves, we say we're frugal. We really care about money and making sure that we utilize money in the right way. We use the connotation that implies positive. Somebody else, we say the guy's a miser. Ah, the person doesn't ever give out a penny. So don't have two separate weights and measures. One to measure ourselves and one to measure somebody else. It should be the other way around. If you look at somebody else and measure ourselves how we would look at somebody else, and we should look at somebody else how we would normally measure ourselves. It brings us past 8 o'clock. I really thank everyone for joining us. We'll put it on the YouTube and we'll send it out as well. Have a beautiful, beautiful Shabbos. It's coming soon. Rosh Hashanah is coming soon. Thank you all for joining. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you so much, Rabbi. Thank you. 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 Thank you.